We're going to spend one class session on the correspondence between Descartes and Princess Elizabeth. And it's really not enough time to, to go over everything that they're talking about. Because what you've got here are two really brilliant people writing back and forth to each other. And you notice that, at least in the, the little portions that I had you read, that um, in large part the, the relationship is a little asymmetrical. Descartes is this really well-established philosopher by this time. And Elizabeth is actually a noblewoman who, um, you know, she actually is a princess, but unfortunately she's princess of a territory that really no longer belongs to her family. So she's, it's hard to describe um, this in terms that would make, make sense to a lot of people. Um, she was part, her, her territory was part of the Holy Roman Empire, which was this very anachronistic uh, organization by that time. But it, it, what was going on at the time, and you see some reflections of this in these discussions, was um, Germany, and really all of Europe, was in the middle of wars between Catholics and Protestants. And also not just between Catholics and Protestants, but also Protestants and Protestants. You know, once the churches started splitting from each other, um, Lutherans, you know, not only fought against Catholics, they fought against Calvinists, they fought against Anabaptists, and Germany had all of these. So, um, I noticed, I, you know, I know that she's from Bohemia, and we nowadays call that the Czech Republic, but that was part of the German sphere at that time. So, what you've got here is somebody who's in charge of um, political affairs, and really windy out there. Um, somebody who, you know, you, as you read her letters, she can't get away from having to take care of all these different things. And she's not just taking care of her family. She's, she has to be concerned with her people. There's all these religious controversies going on at the time. <coughs> she herself was somebody who would, who would give shelter to um, some of the people who were being persecuted. And Descartes, like I said, was an important philosopher by now. He's already written some of his major works. He's seen as sort of a rising force. He's, he's put forth a new philosophy. Bless you. Um, and they begin this correspondence after having met in person. And Descartes was very impressed with, with Elizabeth. Uh, and Elizabeth is very impressed with Descartes. So you see a lot of that in the very beginning parts of their letters. You know, he's just so glad you wrote me. Uh, it's so wonderful, I can be filled with pride that you enjoyed my work. And then they get down to brass tacks. And what's really striking about this is Descartes really is a first-rate philosopher. He ranks up there with Plato and Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas, Kant, Nietzsche, these people that you, know, you shouldn't get through college without having read at one point or another. Um, Elizabeth is able to raise problems for this guy. Descartes, at, at certain points, actually says, you got me there. Yeah, you're right. I, I'm actually, I should have clarified what I was saying, because um, what I said actually doesn't make that much sense. Thanks for pointing it out. And they go back and forth in some of the correspondence, where he'll say, here's what I think, and she says, sounds good, except for point A, point B, point C, point D, point E. And then he'll address maybe three of those. This is what philosophers do. Um, actually, this is what people do in, in all fields once you start rising to a higher level. People can put out ideas and say, here's what I think, and then people criticize those ideas. They don't take it personally. You notice they're very good about that. She doesn't say, I can't believe that you didn't like my idea. He doesn't say that sort of thing either. They are, these are people who are fascinated with figuring things out. And what is the key thing that they're really trying to figure out? There's, there's two in the, the parts of the reading that I had for you. One is the relationship between the mind and the body. Something we're still talking about today. There's a huge literature out there that just keeps growing and growing and growing, you know, with, with bestsellers about this kind of mind and that kind of mind and how the mind affects the body and vice versa. And um, scientists are a little bit closer to having some solid ideas about this, but uh, not an awful lot more than in Descartes' day. 
a lot of it is, is fairly speculative. Even when they bring in MRI machines and things like that, you got to interpret those results. There's a lot of really interesting things being said, really interesting, because they're pretty speculative. Um, so this is something that Descartes was all about. Uh, the other thing that he talks about is um, reason and the good life. And these are connected with each other. What, what kind of life is the life that a person ought to live? If they really want to be happy, how is that connected with rationality? So those are the things we're going to explore in, in the parts that we're looking at. There's other letters, too, where they're, they're talking about other things. So let's start with this. The mind and the body, or let's say the soul, too. Because Descartes uses the term soul. And in French, um, mind and spirit, it's the same word, esprit. Um, they have a different word for, for soul, um, but Descartes doesn't use it that often. Usually the word that he's using is, is uh, esprit in this. And so you can think of it as, as your mind, you can think of it as your personality, you can think of it as, as your soul. It all depends on how you want to look at it. Descartes was actually a Christian of some sort, um, and probably fairly deist in, in conceptions of things, so um, not, not particularly interested in, in traditional um, dogmas of Christianity or in the, the person of Christ himself. Um, but you know, he, he, he did at least uh, believe that there was a God and that God somehow determined everything and created things with certain natures, that sort of thing. You see that coming up a little bit later. So he also does think that the soul survives after death. The soul or the mind, whatever that happens to be. Um, he's very hazy on what, that, what happens after death. He doesn't seem to be particularly concerned about that. He's more like, yeah, I'm sure it's fine. Um, he doesn't go into any, any descriptions of that. Um, but he does believe that the soul is, or the mind is something distinct from the body. So that distances him from a number of people, because some people think that the mind just is the body. Right? If, if you think that your mind or your soul is your brain, then you would be what we would call a materialist. Somebody who thinks that everything is, is matter. Or, I mean, you can, maybe it's energy too, you know, since you know, Einstein has been around and all this stuff. But um, basically, the, the idea that would be opposed here would be that everything is, is of one kind of substance, material substance, or matter energy or something like that. And so if the brain is who you are, then you wouldn't have this kind of viewpoint that Descartes does. Descartes says that the mind and the body are radically different from each other. And this comes up in the first couple letters. So we want to we look at, at this. Um, so Elizabeth writes him, and she says, um, I've got a problem. Here's my problem. Your notion of the soul entirely include, excludes extension. So that, that's a word that you want to know. And what would be opposed to extension? Thought. What is extension? Well, think about this. Or think about that desk that you're sitting at. Right? How, how long would you say this is? I'm just guessing in inches. Five inches, six Four. inches, four inches? I'm very bad with estimating that sort of thing myself. So you're probably right and I'm probably wrong. Um, how thick do you think it is? Maybe an inch? Okay. Those are its dimensions, right? That is because it's extended. It exists in space. It also exists in time, but we don't want to make it too complex in talking about that. And you can, you can measure it. I'm not going to break this because the school would get mad if I did. Um, but paper, right? It's it's a certain. This is what a 
9 by 11, I think, is our, bless me, our standard thing. Now we got two pieces of paper. The number has changed. That's still the same, you know, basic size, but now part of that size is over here, part of it's over here. This is extended being. Your body is, is extended being. The, the seat that your, your rear is, is in while you're sitting, you know, that's extended being. The, the pen that you're, you're writing with, all of that is extended being. Anything you can touch, see, smell, we perceive it through the senses, that is all extension. Even now, you know, you go very small with an electron microscope where we can see, you know, really, really tiny things like all of the, uh, um, the cells, you know, what's inside the cells, what's inside the bits of the cells. Um, that's all still extension. Your brain. Your brain is this incredibly complex wetware computer. That's an extended thing, right? They can take, they could cut out part of your brain, and it'd be missing that part. It's not like your your mind, which maybe would be something quite different. And Descartes thought that body is extended substances. This is a substance. Um, it exists. It has certain qualities, and you can break it down and make it into other things, right? I mean, that's what happened. That's how we got this here in the first place. Somebody took whatever we make chalk out of. Is it limestone? I don't really know. Does anybody know? Oh, hand. And they crushed it and did processes to it and then, you know, put it in a certain shape and then we get chalk and then I, I use it and I'm changing it by putting it on the board. Right? Your mind is a very different kind of thing. As a matter of fact, if you're used to thinking about things in terms of bodies, your mind isn't a thing. Your mind is a substance that thinks, Descartes says in his works. Now, what Elizabeth says is, um, I ask you for a definition of the soul that homes in on its nature more thoroughly than does the one you give in your meditations. I want one that characterizes what it is as distinct from what it does. What does the mind do? The mind thinks, right? What is the mind? So if it's not the brain, and it's not some other extended thing, well, what the hell is it then? And, and saying, well, it's that thing that thinks. That doesn't help you out an awful lot if you really want to know what it is. Um, you're just telling, you know, an activity. You're sort of like uh, asking about, um, well, who, who's this? Well, he's the guy sitting there, right? Well, that doesn't tell you anything, does it? Um, now, if we say, you know, brown hair, brown eyes, how tall are you? Like 5'11". 5'11". What year were you born? Uh, 95. Born in 95. Now we're actually giving qualities that tell you something about who this is or, or what kind of, you know, being this is, right? If we you, you use your name, I'm not going to use it on, on the camera, but um, that, that says this particular thing and, and your name isn't good for him, right? You, you shouldn't answer if I say his name, right? Um, now we're actually getting to what something is. But to say, well, he, he's the guy who comes in at uh, uh, what time? What time? Uh, Nine uh, twenty-five, and sits in this chair and takes notes, and then you know exits the room at, at that time. That doesn't tell you anything, does it? So to say that the the mind thinks that's not really telling us an awful lot. Um, so Elizabeth says, can you can you give me something better here? And Descartes, typically enough for a philosopher, says, well, okay, let me back up. Let's, let's set this out. Let's set this out in terms of ideas. So he says, um, all the knowledge that we can have of the human mind or soul depends on two facts about it. The fact that it thinks, that tells us some of the stuff about it, and then the fact that it is somehow united to the body. That's what a lot of their discussion is about, and that's what the passions of the soul, which we're going to read next, are, are about. And he says, um, <coughs> being united to the body, it can act on the body, and it can be acted on along with it. 
He says, I said almost nothing about the second part in my other works because I wanted to focus on the first part. What is it to think? What is, what is thought? Uh, we're not reading those, but you could, you could always look up the meditations or the discourse and you'd be able to get a, get a good idea about that. So he says, um, I'll try to explain here how I conceive of the soul's union with the body and how it has the power to move the body. Again, something that's, that's kind of miraculous and hard to, to explain. So he says, we have four basic kinds of ideas. And all the other ideas that we have are put onto these sort of like putting something onto a template. And some of these ideas are things like being, number, duration, or time, right? It's all supplied to everything. Everything that exists is a being, isn't it? Everything that exists can be counted in one way or another. Everything that exists, exists in some way in time. Including, I, I guess, for Descartes, God. Uh, different than, say, Augustine. Um, then we have the notion of extension. And, you know, what does that include? Shape, movement, all sorts of things. Then we have the notion of thought. That includes um, the understanding or intellect, its perceptions, and the will, and its inclinations. Then we have the notion of the soul and the body together, the union. And, okay, so far so good. You know, if, we, if, we, if we go along with Descartes and we say, okay, let's say that the mind is something different from the body. These are things you can think separately from each other, right? You can think of shapes and movements without thinking of a person involved in that. You can think of understanding what goes on with your mind when you're thinking, when you're doubting, when you're, you're uh, considering, when you're reaching conclusions. You can think of your choices that you make, right? Independently of whatever sort of physical context they're in. Um, what is it to think about the union of the body and the soul, the mind and the, the body being together? Well, that consists in a couple things. One is that the mind can act on the body. Uh, how do you know that? You got yourself here, didn't you? Now, unless you're like sleepwalking, or, you know, you're following some instructions that were like implanted in your brain by some sort of chip. You actually chose to get yourself here to this classroom. You made your mind, you made your, your body do something by willing it, right? Um, if I were to, you know, if I want to take my jacket off, that's a choice, right? Put my jacket back on. We could do this all day long. Um, you know, picking up a thing. That's, those are all volitions. Those are all choices on my part. And sometimes we have automatic things, like somebody jumps out at you and you go, whoa, right? Your, your body kind of reacts to it, and then your mind does something afterwards, like get, get scared or amazed. But um, for the most part, what you're doing is your mind is making your body do things. Thank God you don't have to do it with everything, you know, you don't have to think about breathing, right? Or your heart beating. If you did, you'd, you'd be screwed or digesting your food. But you know, you'll choose to go over there and eat something. And you can change your heart rate by willing uh, with some practice. Now, does the body affect the mind? What do you think? Yeah, like when, like when uh, I guess, like, say after a game, you're really tired, you're not really thinking straight, kind of like, you just want to... That's a great example, yeah. Uh, some people get kind of fuzzy-headed and they have, a tr they have trouble concentrating that. Uh, even if they will to, to try to, I need to think this through, they, they find themselves unable to. Other people become irritable 
when they're tired, right? Yeah. And um, what is it to become irritable or angry with people? Descartes calls that a passion. And when we feel passions, the body is acting on, on the mind. If you get angry, can you tell yourself, I will myself not to be angry? Does that work? Have you ever tried it? Well, let's think about other passions. Maybe you haven't done that with anger. Um, can you will yourself to be happy? I'm just going to be happy today. You can like walk around and whistle and you know go through all the motions, but are you really happy in your feelings? No. I mean, can you will yourself not to be sad when you're sad? You can do things, you know, you can like will to do things that might make you less sad. Like um, if I don't know, if eating chocolate helps helps you when you're depressed, then uh, you, you eat some chocolate, your mood lifts a little bit, right? Um, but that's not the same thing as like willing not to be sad, is it? Or to be amazed. You can conceal your amazement at something because you don't want people to realize that you don't know, you know, what they're doing. But um, you can't keep yourself from feeling it. That's a way in which the body acts on, on the soul. The body acts on the soul in other ways, too. How do you know I'm here? I was almost late today. How would you know that I'm here and that you shouldn't be back in bed sleeping? So we can see you? Exactly, yeah. And, and see, sight is a form of sense perception, as we call it, right? And what if you were doubting, you know, maybe, maybe he did some hologram thing, you know? Dr. Sadler's got some technology we don't know about. What could you do? One of you could like get up and touch me, right? And if, if, if your finger goes all the way through, oh, class is canceled. <coughs> it's all been a big, big trick. Um, but no, you know, you poke me and I say, ow, that, that hurts. Um, now, I'm having a perception of pain, you're having a perception of touch. Those are ways in which the, the body affects the mind. Because if the body is just extension, if it's just basically meat and nerves and stuff like that, is the body actually feeling pain? Is the body actually feeling the smoothness of the table? Or is it your mind? It's really your mind. Your, your sight in, in seeing me or hearing me, it's mediated through the senses, which are mechanical, which are bodily, but the perceptions actually exist in your mind. So, all right, so Descartes says, um, we want to keep these things apart from each other. And Elizabeth then, you know, um, well, there's one other thing that Descartes says that I want to stress. He says that um, by not keeping these apart from each other, we've often gotten these mixed up with each other. And this we know fairly well. This we actually know fairly well in certain respects. This we don't know quite so well. Because the only way to actually find out about your own thought is to observe your own thought, to use thought to understand itself. And we're pretty lazy when it comes to that, and a lot of times we, we don't do that. And we model our ideas about thought after our ideas about bodies, about extended things. So, you know, how do things affect each other in the mind, not just in the brain? You know, think about how we, we talk about bodies, like this one's moving, it's this one, and now this one moves. That's, that's motion. That's extended motion. That's not the way things work in the mind. That's not like, you know, the senses impinging on, on your, your consciousness, or your reflexive thinking about yourself, or deciding you want to be a better or worse person. It doesn't work like space and time and, and bodies. There's something, there's a different logic to it. Um, so unless we pay close attention, we're not going to realize we're mixing these things up. Um, we've also tended to think about how the mind works on the body by thinking about the way bodies work on bodies. You see this all the time, even today, still in psychological literature, where people are doing brain scans and thinking that that explains the mind. 
tells us a lot about what's going on in the brain. It doesn't actually tell us that much about what's going on in the mind or how the mind works. Unless you make the assumption, again, that the mind just is the brain. Even then, it still doesn't tell you that much because these CAT scans, you know, um, we're still trying to figure out what, what the hell they mean in a lot of cases. So he's kind of stressing that there, and then he starts talking about weight, and I don't want to get, I don't want to get bogged down in that or, or her responses about that. But then Elizabeth says, um, "I still don't understand what you're getting at." She says, um, "I'm having trouble understanding how the non-extended and immaterial soul or mind can move the body. How the hell does that happen?" So if it doesn't happen like bodies, you know, pushing on each other, or gears, or things like that, then what's what's actually going on? Um, she says, I, I think it would be easier to concede matter and extension of the soul than to concede an immaterial thing could move and be moved by a body. Because if it's immaterial, how does it actually hook up with something that's material? If they're radically different from each other, how can they have any sort of connection? She says, on the one side, if the soul moves the body through, through, you know, informing it, then she, here she uses this term, the spirits, the animal spirits that, you know, they thought were like in your brain and also in your body. Um, we can just substitute other things there. If, if the, the soul moves the body through the brain, then electrical impulses and hormonal changes and chemicals and stuff like that would have to somehow think. But that seems weird. And Descartes says nothing of a bodily kind of thing, so that's not going to work. And he says, on the other side, you show in your meditations the body could move the soul, but it's hard to understand that the soul, if it's become accustomed to reasoning well, could actually lose all of that because of the body. Like, you know, with the fatigue thing, right? Um, so Descartes says, well, okay, I have, I have, to, I have to clarify here. What I should have said is that after we distinguish these kinds of ideas, we need to think about how we actually get to know these ideas. And that will help us out. So he, he doesn't worry about this one at that point. How do we get our, our understanding of thought? The only thing that can tell us about thought is by thinking about it. The only way, the only access that we have to our minds is our own minds, the intellect. And what about extended things? There, if we want to understand what they really are, there we, we need the help of the imagination. Um, you know, let's, let's take another example. So. We want to figure out the actual dimensions of this. How are you actually, when you're eyeballing this, figuring out the dimensions of this sort of thing? Are you like putting an imaginary ruler up to it and like, you know, ticking off the numbers? That's what I'm doing. You're probably doing something kind of similar to that. Either that or you're just picking a number out of the air. 86. It's 86 inches. No, you have to have some way of thinking about that. How do we know about you know how, how material objects actually behave in relation to each other, like the falling down thing, law of gravity? You, you could use your intellect to understand that. There's equations that you can you probably learned in physics class, right? And then forgot. But you also need the imagination. The imagination is your capacity to call up images in your mind. Um, what about the union of the, the soul and the body? There, you know, the intellect and imagination could be useful, but they're actually pretty weak for figuring that sort of thing out. What we really need are the senses. We have to experience. We have to perceive. He says, um, what belongs to the soul's union with the body is a very dark affair when it comes to the intellect, whether alone or aided by the imagination. But it's very clear, very bright, clear, in 
French, when the senses have a hand in it. And he goes on, he says, that's why people who never come at things in a theoretical way and only use their senses have no doubt that the soul means <coughs> the body and that the body acts on the soul. They regard soul and body as a single thing. They understand their, their union. When you think of yourself as a person, Descartes says, if you're not doing philosophy, you think of yourself as a soul and a body somehow fused together. You don't, you don't really know how, but don't you experience every single day the fact that your, your soul or your mind is affected by your body? You're perceiving things all the time, right? As you're walking around, you're actually seeing things, otherwise you'd fall down into a pit or, you know, God knows what else, run into a car. Um, you feel feelings, right? Um, you also feel sensations like being uncomfortable or being tired, hungry. Those are all ways in which the soul is being affected by the body. And you also have the experience all the time of getting to do what it is that you want to do and making choices and making your body move around in different ways, you know? Are you going to dance now or not? Are you going to, you know, um, throw the ball or not? My, uh, my uh, son got in trouble just the other day for throwing a snowball, you know? Not allowed to throw snowballs at other kids. Were you guys allowed to throw snowballs? Never, it was, never can make one. Really? Yeah. It, was, it was frowned upon that when I was a kid. But kids, you know, did a lot of that. Nowadays, can't do that. And he got in trouble because the teacher said, well, you could have chosen not to throw a snowball, right? There's, a, there's the possibility of making choices. So, you know, he could have said, well, my body just, you know, my body was acting on its own. And, you know, made the snowball and uh, then, like, saw the kid and, like, okay, I'm going to get that kid through the snowball. And the teacher would have said, that's, that's BS. You chose to do it because the, the mind does affect the body. Right? So, um, he says, what teaches us how to conceive the soul's union with the body is the ordinary course of life and conversation. Not meditating, not studying things that exercise the imagination. And um, I'm going to skip a little bit ahead. Descartes, Descartes stresses that it's very difficult for us to understand these two things as separate things and think about this at the same time that it's almost like we can pick one viewpoint or the other. We can pick the viewpoint where we're looking at the mind and body as connected with each other, or we can pick the viewpoint where they're separated from each other, and they're very hard to bring into view at, at the same time and hold in our, our minds. Um, so Elizabeth says, this is where we're going to take this as our launching point. Um, that's all very nice. But I find from your letter that the senses show me that the soul moves the body. But how it does so, the senses don't tell me anything about that. I understand that there is a union, and that, you know, that means that things go both ways. The, the mind moves the body, the body affects the mind. But how does that take place? That's what I want to know. I don't want to just know that they do that. I want to know how. I want knowledge. I want full understanding of these things. Um, she says, you know, it could be that the, the soul has properties we don't know, which could overturn your doctrine. Uh, maybe the soul is, in fact, extended. Um, I still have this initial doubt. And by the end of their correspondence, Descartes is going to be able to, to resolve these doubts, but it's going to take a while. And it's also going to take writing a book, which we're going to look at shortly, the, on the passions of the soul. Because the passions of the soul are one major way in which the mind and the body move each other. So, um, let's move. Now we're shifting ahead many letters, jumping over quite a few. And let's talk about reason, the life of reason. Uh, Descartes suggests that the two of them read this guy, Seneca. And Seneca wrote a book called On the Happy Life.
And it was, it was pretty popular around that time. Seneca was an ancient philosopher. He would have been like, you know, a contemporary of, well, not, not you know, that close, but some of the other people that we've, we've studied, like, say, Augustine and Cicero, you know, he's in that period of centuries, in the ancient period. Um, he's a Roman guy. And Seneca wrote this book that a lot of people had read, and so Descartes says, well, hey, let's read this together. Sort of like, you know, this is what people do when they're intellectuals. They read books together, and then they discuss them. Book clubs, right? There's a book club of two. A book club by correspondence. And Descartes says, um, yeah, I kind of shouldn't have recommended that book to you. Why? I find that his treatment isn't rigorous enough to deserve to be followed. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set out how I think the subject should have been treated by a philosopher like him. Um, so Descartes is actually going to give us his own views, riffing off of Seneca. Sort of like um, what you guys do sometimes in your papers. You know, you do the, the write about, you know, show me that you actually understand the concept first, and then say, here's what I actually think. I think this guy didn't actually say everything that needed to be said. Here's what I have to contribute to it. So that's what Descartes is going to do here. Yeah, and he says that um, we can make ourselves happy unaided by anything external to us, provided we respect three conditions that are related in Descartes' book, the um, Discourse on the Method. Descartes says we should tr always try to use our mind as well as we can in order to know what we should or shouldn't do. So when we're making decisions, that means we ought to actually think the decisions through. We shouldn't just go by feeling. We shouldn't just go by tradition. We should actually think it through. Um, what should you major in here? That should be a well thought out decision on your on your part, right? Um, how many hours a week should you put in on schoolwork? That should be something that you ought to think about, not just leave to chance. He says he should have a firm and constant resolution to do whatever reason advises. So whatever reason tells us we, have, we should do, that's what we should do. Because the appetites and the, you know, the senses, they're going to lead us astray. Reason can actually tell us what is good for us and what's bad for us. And now it's one thing to know that something is good for you, it's another to actually do that, isn't it? You guys all have experience with that. You know, you resolve, hey, I'm going to do this because it's really good for me. And then suddenly you find yourself doing something completely different. I'm not going to go out with that person because they're, they're bad news. And you go out with that person. You know? Louis C.K., I was watching one of his comedy routines. And he was talking about something exactly like this. Um, and I forget the exact phraseology that he had. But he was talking about you know, two parts of his, his mind. There's the part that knows something. And then there's the part that says, yeah, but maybe. Are you guys familiar with this, uh, this uh, quite brilliant epistemological discussion? Uh, like, you know, I know I, I shouldn't eat thirds, but maybe if I, if I do, it won't affect me. And, and you know that this is all BS over here. But we have this tendency to listen to it, right? To not follow reason. So there's a lot of things like that. If we did follow reason, Descartes thinks, we would actually have very happy lives. We wouldn't get ourselves into all the sort of things that we, we do. Um, and if we do, that, if we do that a lot, we'll get into the habit of following reason. And that will make us virtuous. And then we'll have the habit of not wanting some of the things that, that not having drives us nuts. Or not having enough of drives us nuts. So this will lead to a happy life. He says, we imagine that health and riches are achievable by our exertions or are owed to our nature. Um, if we think that, we're actually setting ourselves up. He says, nothing can, can impede our contentment except for desire, wanting what we don't have, right? Or regret. Do you guys have any regrets at this point? You're, you know. 18, 19, do you have regrets about things, you know, in middle school or high school or what you've done your first semester here at Marist? Feeling regret sucks, doesn't it? It makes us unhappy. 
Um, or, going further, repentance. Repentance is, is sort of like regret, except you know you really did the wrong thing. Not just wrong because it was like imprudent and didn't give you what you wanted, but maybe you hurt somebody or you broke some, some you know, terrible rule or you know, betrayed somebody. Um, so you know, if we could live without these, we'd be very happy, wouldn't we? If we could, if we could have our desires within certain bounds and not feel regrets because we didn't do the wrong thing for us, and not feel repentance because we didn't do the wrong thing in a, in a broader sense, wouldn't that be a happy life? I know I'd be a hell of a lot happier if I didn't have those sort of things. And he, he says, it's not by the way that happiness is incompatible with every kind of desire, only with desires that are accompanied by impatience and sadness, two of the passions. Um, so he's, he's telling uh, Elizabeth this, and Elizabeth says, um, tell me more about this. And then Descartes um, starts setting out how this is actually going to work. Before that, though, she does raise a problem. This is one that you should, you should think about. So if reason is what's going to lead us to a good life, what if reason gets screwed up? Is everybody in possession of their, their faculty of reason? I know all of you are, but is everybody in the world? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes reason gets kind of subordinated to serving the passions. Like when somebody's in the grip of an ideology and they're very emotionally attached to that. And they can they can seem fairly reasonable for a while. And then you start probing it. And they do think that they're being rational, but they're not. Is there anybody further gone than that? I mean, there's some people that are crazy, right? Just nuts. They can't control themselves. Um, could they have a happy life? Descartes says no. Not if, not if it depends on having reason, because if you're crazy, you're, you're you know, not using reason. It's been sort of short-circuited. Imagine that the higher thinking portions of your brain could be shut off so it was just the, uh, the lower portions, the reptile brain. Fear and flight and aggression and desire. And you couldn't really, you know, get a handle on that. You just found yourself doing things over and over again impulsively. You, you couldn't be happy. You might be happy for you know a moment while you're enjoying what you want, but you're going to do so many things that are going to get you in trouble and, and uh, lead to outcomes that you don't like that you're not really going to be happy overall. Um, so she says, you know, some diseases seem to remove the power of reasoning. So that's a problem. Um, others reduce one's power of reasoning and prevent one from following the maxims that good sense would have created, making even the most moderate man liable to be carried away by his passions, being less able to disentangle himself from chance events that require quick decisions. Um, so she's pointing out, you know, our emotions can be a problem. The fact that we have to make quick decisions about things can be a problem. And certain diseased states can put us in that condition. Why is she talking about diseased states? Because she's talking about the body. Are there any conditions of the body that can make you more liable to being emotional that you can think of? How about when you're in pain, like physical pain, chronic pain? Um, are you yourself? Not as much, right? Um, what about if you're depressed, not because something terrible happened, like you know, a death of a loved one or something like that, but because you have a chemical imbalance in your brain and it's sending the wrong signals. So all your dopamine gets sucked up, you know, and, and you, you don't know that you need to take a dopamine reuptake inhibitor to, to keep that from happening. That would be physical, right? And that would be something that would affect your emotions. And when people are depressed, they don't just get sad. They get anxious. They get angry, irritable, all sorts of other things. Um, other people, you know, when people are bipolar. Why, why do we call it bipolar? There's the depressive side, and then there's the super high, 
is better than any drug, manic side. Yeah. Would they actually have um, thought of like mental disease as like real disease back then though? Oh yeah. Yeah, they were they were investigating those sorts of things. Um, now, of course, they, they didn't have anything like the technology or you know the theory that we have, but this was something that they were becoming very interested in in the early modern period. Um, so Elizabeth, you know, and Elizabeth is kind of at the heart of where a lot of the scientific stuff is taking place. So it would make sense that she'd be familiar with these things. It's not that they didn't have any notion of it before, that the body could have certain disorders that would produce states in the mind, because um, Augustine talks about that and Aristotle talks about that, but um, it just wasn't as sophisticated. So, but all these are examples. These these are things to worry about. If if you know, having a good life depends on rationality, then can't the body? interfere with that? If your body is doing poorly? So put that in the back of your mind for a moment. Descartes is gonna, gonna talk about a few other things. He says that when it comes to the good life we have to think about three different things. One is happiness or beatitude. The other one is the supreme good. Third thing is the final end, or goal, towards which our actions ought to strive. So these are different from each other. Seneca's mixing these all up. So we want to distinguish these from each other. What is happiness for, for Descartes? It's contentment. It's being, being satisfied. Um, living a, a life in which we do enjoy some pleasures, um, but only those that reason suggests to us, and not being in the grips of our passions. It's a, it's a, a life that um, has contentment of mind, like he says. Uh, what is the supreme good? The supreme good is actually virtue. Being, and Descartes is an interesting um, conception of virtue. It means following reason, making it a habit to actually follow reason. So a rational life is a, a virtuous life. Virtue, that state of virtue, is the supreme good. And the final end or goal is what we ought to strive for. And we want to have, we want to be virtuous so that we can enjoy happiness. Both of these are, in a certain way, what we ought to strive for. But we can't enjoy the happiness securely unless we actually do what we need to do to live a fully rational life. Um, he also talks about some other philosophers um, I'm going to skip over that because we don't have an awful lot of time. So um, then Descartes comes back to Elizabeth's problem. He says, when I spoke of the of beatitude of happiness, that depends entirely on our free will. I mean, that's another thing that we ought to put in here, too. So it's not just reason. We also have to use our, our will to follow what reason is telling us, don't we? Isn't that the problem when we, you know, met... Now imagine the good angel and bad angel on our shoulders. The good angel is reason, the bad angel is our appetites and passions. The good angel is telling us, you've got to study for the exam, because the exam is coming up you know, next week, and uh, you don't want to be caught unprepared. And the bad angel is saying, screw that, something's on. I'm going to watch that. Uh, we should watch this instead, and call some people over. And you know, we'll probably study after that. You know? Reason is telling you something, and... Who gets to decide ultimately between those? You do, right? That's why you've got one of each on the shoulder. You could like turn to one and say, go away, or turn to the other one, go away. It's up to you. Your will decides that. So um, he says, I spoke of a beatitude that depends entirely on our free will and can have, be had by anybody without an outside help. You make the good point that some illnesses deprive the sufferer of the ability to reason. 
and thereby deprive them of the ability to enjoy the satisfaction that a rational mind can bring. Um, this shows me that when I generalized about all men, I should have confined myself to those who have free use of their reason and know through, through that path that the path they must take to reach this beatitude. For everybody wants to become happy, but many don't know how. Often, some trouble in the body prevents the will from being free. Are, are there any things that could be going on with your body that could keep, not your will from being completely free, but keep you from being able to make certain choices? Sure. You know, fatigue is a, is a great example. Um, that's an easy enough one to cure, just go to bed. <laughs> Wake up the next day and now you, you have, you know, some, some willpower back. But are there other things that can happen with our body or our brain that would keep us from being able to, to exercise free will in some cases? Yeah, certain kinds of brain damage. Um, we learned a lot about this. Actually, to go back to that question about how much do people know, we learned a lot about brain damage and things like that because of the world wars, believe it or not. Because so many soldiers got, you know, head injuries. And we're actually learning a lot more about them because of uh, the... Uh, Iraq and Afghanistan wars, and all these, you know, people who have sustained um, brain injuries. Um, we know, and they knew back then, that certain things can happen to the brain. They were pretty hazy about what these were, but they could radically affect a person's personality. Um, lobotomy would be another example, you know, of uh, things that can affect a person's capacity for free will. Um, drugs could too, couldn't they? The addict, is the addict truly free, making choices in the same way that you are day to day? Or are they driven by, some, by a need that seems to squeeze out free will? What do you think? Could the addict be unfree? Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, Descartes talks about tobacco dulling the mind. You know, a lot of people smoked pipes back then. Descartes appears not to have uh, thought too highly of that. Um, so he, he concedes, you're right, Princess Elizabeth. Bless you. Uh, and then he says, there's indispositions that don't entirely upset one's senses, but merely alter the humors, inclining the person towards an abnormal intensity of sadness or anger or some other passion. It sounds a lot like, you know, what we call psychological disorders, doesn't it? These can certainly cause distress, but they can be overcome, and the harder to conquer, the more satisfaction the soul can take in doing so. Um, so Descartes is saying sometimes you could actually overcome them, but it would take an awful lot of work. He admits that. It's going to be harder for a person who is chronically depressed to be happy, to will in accordance with reason, than somebody who's not. Uh, environmental things could probably play a role, too. He doesn't talk about that here, but... Imagine growing up in a, a really crappy environment where everybody's yelling at you all the time. You're not depressed, but you just you know, have a hard time concentrating. Um, it would make it hard for you to actually, you know, first of all, reason out what's good for you and then to, to will to do so, wouldn't it? It could, it could be overcome, he thinks, but the odds are pretty, pretty low. Now, he says... Um, in order to know exactly how much each thing can contribute to our contentment, we have to know what the, what the causes are. This is one of the things that we need to, to learn in order to be able to acquire virtue. So he says, for any action of our soul through which we acquire some perfection is virtuous, and all there is to our contentment is just our inner awareness of having some perfection. By perfection, it doesn't mean like absolute perfection. It means something on a scale, right? Um, so he says there's two kinds of pleasures, ones that belong to the mind alone and one that belong to the human being, the mind and the body together. And the second group often appear to be greater than they are. We often get led astray by thinking that the pleasures that we experience through the body and its interaction with the mind are greater pleasures than the pleasures available to the mind alone. Um, that's one way we go astray. So we'd have to get that straightened out if we're not to, to go off. He also says, often passion makes us believe certain things are much better and more desirable than they are. Um, what does he mean by that? So 
So passion means emotion, right? Do emotions make us believe things to be different than they are? And make some things <laughs> appear to be better for us than they are? Yeah? Well, like in terms of people, like you said before, relationships, how if you're blinded at first. Oh, yeah, the infatuation, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we often think people are so interesting and, and everything they do is so so wonderful and then after you know like a, you know, a couple of months we're like we should knock off doing that thing that I used to find so cute because um, now it's driving me nuts what we were you know seeing it as something good before and now we're seeing it as something something bad um, what about anger he talks about anger here what is it that we want when we're angry What do you want when you're angry? Fundamentally, yeah. I mean, I guess it depends on like what kind of angry you are. Like, are you angry at like a salesperson, or are you angry at? Let's take like, let's take a salesperson. That that that's a good, uh, very concrete <laughs> example. Um, you could want like an incentive to not be mad anymore, like an incentive to keep shopping at that. Oh, place. you want them to like give you something in yeah. return. Or you could want like I don't know, like, like you could want them to get in trouble or something. Yeah. You know. Okay, my mom, by the way, was like an expert at getting stuff out of people along that first line. What are you going to give me since you screwed things up? You know, I never realized how smart she was until I started working salespeople. Um, let's take the second one. You want you want them to get like written up or something yeah. like that. Okay, so what you really want is for them to get hurt in some way, to, because they hurt you in some way. Um, a lot of definitions of anger have to do with like causing causing hurt in return. Uh, to the person who unjustly or wrongly hurt you. Uh, it could be humiliation, it could be being you know, punished, it could be all sorts of things. Um, now, when we are angry, we see that as a good. And that actually is a good, Descartes is going to say. Is that as good as maintaining our relationships with those who are there watching us get angry? No, but when we're angry, we feel like you know, suddenly the, the scales tilt, right? Like, I don't care what it's going to cost me. I'm going to get my satisfaction. Well, because what's going on in the passion is the passion is actually leading us to, to misevaluate how good things are. Descartes thinks revenge, satisfaction, that is actually a good in a certain way. It's just not as good as, like, you know, ticking off my wife who's next to me who's, you know, thinking... Why does this guy have to like go off the handle? Or, now here's another place we can't go to. Or you know, what else do people do it with anger? Uh, that would be along those lines. Um, now we're never going to get anything from this salesperson. Um, now we'll never get our whatever it is fixed. Is anger is anger bad for you in other ways? Does it screw up your body to some degree? Not so much at your age, but at, at my age, you blood have to start, pressure. yeah, blood pressure, you got to start watching that. It's not just that. They figured out that people who get chronically angry tend to live shorter lives. So if I want to live a longer life, got to tone down the anger. And you can think to yourself when you're angry, man, I shouldn't get so angry because, you know, I want to live a long time. But anger says, screw that. This is what really matters here. And it's the same thing for, with, with other emotions, too. The, the passions tend to cloud our judgment about what is really good for us and what is really bad for us. That's the interaction between the body and the mind. So reason has to step in, like he says. The true function of reason is to examine the real value of all the goods whose acquisition seems to depend in some way on our conduct. All the goods that have, where we have some role in deciding whether we get them or not. Um, he says, the right, re right use of reason in the conduct of life is to examine and consider, here's a key term, without passion, without allowing other things to cloud our judgment. The value of all the perfections, those of the body and the mind, that we can acquire through our conduct so that we'll always choose the best. Reason, so reason is sort of like a calculator. You put in good, you know, data, you're going to get the right answer out of it. But if you allow somebody to, you know, start 
tinkering with the keys like the passions do, then the sort of thing that you were talking about um, before happens where a person thinks they're being rational, but they're not actually being rational. And then we also have to choose to follow reason. This has to become a habit, as uh, Descartes says. He actually says practical knowledge is when you have the habit of following reason and it's telling you what is the, the right thing to do, what is, what is the better good, what is the, the lesser good. Um, so Elizabeth actually brings up another issue that makes Descartes have to clarify something else. She says, you know, that sounds really great, <clears throat> but wouldn't you have to have perfect knowledge? Wouldn't you have to be like a god to do this? Because to evaluate good things, she says in this way, one must know them perfectly. To know all the good things among which one must choose in the course of an act of life, one would need to have an infinite amount of knowledge. That's, you know, I mean, even if we take just not infinite amounts of knowledge, but um, the amount that a human being could have, you'll hear old people say that youth is wasted on the young. What do they mean by that? Well, you guys are going to make some dumb decisions because you don't know any better, because you don't have enough data going in about what's really good for you and what's bad for you, and you'll end up where those old people are, you know, 60 years later saying, crap, I wish I would have done X instead of Y, because in retrospect, looking at it with the knowledge that I now have of what is really valuable, I would have chosen this. Uh, and then, you know, when you guys are 80, you'll be saying youth is wasted on the young as well, because you'll be in that condition, and there'll be some other, you know, 20-year-olds hearing that thing and saying, what do those old people know? And then those, those people, once they're 80, they'll be saying the same thing. It, having enough information is, is very important, isn't it? Elizabeth has a good point there. Um, she says... Um, you're never going to be really content unless you have full knowledge because when things have gone wrong for someone, they keep changing their mind about the things that remain to be considered so they can't get sec secure satisfaction. And how are we supposed to measure these perfections against each other? Do we, do we look at the ones that are useful for us or do we look at the ones that are useful for other people? Do the ones that are... Are the ones that are useful for other people, do they weigh more than the ones for us? Or should we take a sort of more egotistic viewpoint on it? That's kind of confusing. Um, so she says, I, I really wish you'd define the passions better so I could get some sense of what you're, you're talking about here. Um, and so he'll actually write a whole book, The Passions of the Soul. Um, Descartes goes on and he makes a couple of distinctions that we're going we're gonna to close with. In part because, <coughs> bless you. We, so the passions are ways in which the body and the soul are connected. The body is acting on the soul without the soul choosing it or the mind choosing it, right? You get angry, you don't choose to be angry. You could choose whether you look at things that make you angry or don't make you angry. You could choose whether to count to ten or not, but once you're actually angry, you're angry, right? And you're feeling the anger. So Descartes says that the um, passions are ways in which the body acts on the soul. So in general, we could talk about any thoughts that are aroused in the soul without the concurrence of its will, therefore without any action of the soul, that being a passion. That's a very general sense, but he says, I want to be more specific here. We have passions. <coughs> which are generally what we understand by emotions. Okay. Then we have sensations. Now, for instance, you see this black bag, right? That's a sensation. That's not a feeling. That is a way in which something external to your body is impinging on your, on your eyeballs, and your eyeballs are somehow, you know, through some complicated process, making an impression in your brain. And something's going on in your brain that's producing that sensation in your mind of black bag. Right? 
Um, we also have dreams and imaginations. And he says we also have to be careful to distinguish it from what's um, from nature or <coughs> temperament. Some of you are more naturally happy, more naturally sad, right? More naturally impatient, more naturally patient. Part of your, just who you are. Um, that's different than a, than a passion. That's different than a feeling. And then finally, he talks about uh, inclinations or habits. Um, these are all different from each other. In imagination, you actually are choosing what you want to think about. These are all kinds of thoughts. Descartes says, in the, in the mind. These are all not in the, the body, but in the mind or the soul. But they are also things that tend to be produced by, in one way or another, the body affecting the mind. Dreams, you know, what do you tend to dream about? Stuff that, a lot of people dream about stuff that happened to them that day. Um, your, mind, your brain is sort of like rehearsing things or going back over things. Then you mix a couple monsters and witches and <coughs> crazy things into it from time to time. But that's, you know, um, it's coming from, ultimately coming from, images that came from the outside. Right? The witch that you put into your dream, you probably saw a movie, you know, one time or another. Maybe you made her nose longer or something like that. Um, nature, temperament, inclinations, habits. These are things we build up through the body, aren't they? And sensations are different. Passions are what we really want to focus in on. In part because if we want to be happy, these are the things that probably are at greatest risk for leading us astray, our, our emotions, according to Descartes and Princess Elizabeth. So that's what we're going we're gonna to leave off with and then um, we're going to start reading the passions of the soul.